Hi, my name is Ebenezer Safwendo. I'm a business strategy consultant and a data specialist. Last week we had Reed Havens from Havens Consulting um, teaching us waterfall charts. That was part one. Today we'll continue with part two. Remember to subscribe to my channel and enjoy this interview as Reed takes us through some hacks in Power BI. Um, trick number two. Yeah, let me remember this one. And uh, there we go. I will share the screen again. Here we go. Uh, another one that I was building out for a client. Uh, these these essentially are all the same grand total. You know, 151, 107, point one, point two. Like these all equal the same total from the sales table. They're they're a cut of various true false um, metrics from this, and it's also one, two, three, four, five, five different visuals. You know, if we and and the the thing that I eventually implemented with this was a small multiples visual to consolidate these into one. Um, but the reason that I do this is, you know, if you actually do like a performance analyzer on a page, you'll you know see between all the seconds like 217, 245. Most of this is in the DAX query. It's usually coming from the the visual display and the other, like the time it takes to render the unique visual onto the page, regardless of the data, just because it, it's um, for a bit of performance background, uh, website, web browsers are single threaded. When you open up a web uh, page, like in Chrome or anything else, when it loads the visuals on the page, they're not running in parallel. They uh, they basically run sequentially and they all they all spin up and load. But the more visuals you have on the page, the slower it can take to load. You can have the smallest model. You can have a one row model with uh, what a uh, model with one table and one row. And if you have that one row of data into a measure on seventy visuals on your page, it's still going to take twenty to thirty Same. seconds for that page to load. Exactly. It, it doesn't matter. Does not matter how how optimized and small your model is. The visuals just take time for your CPU to load in a browser. So in general, anytime you can consolidate things together, it's important. Why not? Uh, and normally, though, small multiples break things out categorically. Like you could um, you could do your let let's say you have sales over time, and then you could break it up by product category. So now you have five or six different um, charts in your small multiples that shows you, you know, total sales for camcorder product category and uh, TVs, et cetera. But all of those still equal one grand total. Each of these though is completely independent from each other. And I'll, I'll show you in the actual fact table itself. These are all entirely separate columns. Where are we at data? Here we go. You just basically like this is just a single column that for the entire table, says true or false, is this amount, perspective, SMB, and it doesn't really matter what the qualifiers are. It's basically just a status, yes or no, um, for the entire table. So you can't really break it out because they are non-additive totals. They all equal yeah. independent totals from each other. So it's not something you can normally break out, unlike sales by sales. manufacturer or brand name. So it's like, all right, well, how can I utilize a small multiple? Because my goal is I, I want something like this. I want a single visual. It, it's displaying the same things on this page, but it's in a single visual now. Let's uh, let's go ahead and refresh the visuals. Uh, I'm going to actually clear. Look at that. <laughs> one 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 small multiples visual, and it's you know I've just uh, one fifth the, the the processing That's time to, to load this up because the the DAX is still super easy, very easy to calculate these. Uh, but what I've done is I actually have again I I, I disconnected table that I built. Better said, sorry, not disconnected, but I built a custom table. A lot of the the, the design stuff sometimes requires modeling to support the uh, the output that you need. Um, but I, I have a metric selection table in here that I'll, I'll show you. So in here, there is a uh, two things. There's flag on the axis, so that, that the flag is all of my true and falses. That's all these things down here that are repeating. Then my metric that is in my small multiple selection that is the is expired lapsed, prospective, qualified, etc. So I'm going to show you this table. Mm -hmm. It's not far removed from what you saw before. So there's my flag. It's just simply true or false going down the list. And then there is my group for it, whether or not it's a prospect, you know, etc. So all of my my labels that I have for each of those columns and then back to the model, there is those dis those there are those disconnected. Sorry, 
there are those inactive relationships that are in here. I have it between the flag and the is expired column, the flag and is lapsed column, you know, down the list. So you can uh, consider the last demo that I gave, you can probably guess uh, what the measure is going to be doing, uh, what, what yeah. function it will be using, right? Use our relationship. <laughs> mm -hmm. Basically just, you know, it because it, each of these sections in here, uh, the thing you have to, people have to understand with DAX and probably some do, uh, is each of these calculations, these numbers are calculated entirely independently of each other. They're on an island. It, it is looking for, all right, for flag false and metric is expired. And then considering how the measure was written, it calculates 107 or 151. So it's, you know, it's going down the list and it would be the equivalent of this. You know, as a table, it's just calculating these one row at a time per these filter conditions. It's just simply, you know, visualizing it rather than putting it in a table. That's actually one thing I love about Power BI. If I want to do a demo, tables and visuals are the same. The calculation that this object on this page is running is no different here well, than it is here. It's just simply displaying a bar versus putting a number in a table. The, but the, the, the query generated for both of these is identical that's being run by the engine. So I'm going to open up my measure and Close this, zoom that in. There you go. Very similar process that we did before. If the selection is this prospect, so you know, right there for these these two rows, essentially in this you know table that we kind of just saw, if it's flagged as this prospect, calculate the amount using this relationship, and then it just goes down the list. So that's how it's able to calculate these all independently, because otherwise these are not things you could sum. They're not subtotals of each other, uh, but that measure paired with that table that I did and those relationships allows me to now put this into one visual and, you know, just as a quick reminder again, get this nice fast uh, load time on here versus all these other ones that have to load down here. So you can really see a big change in the uh, the calculations required to, to render all this onto the page. Um, so I, that was a kind of a, a unique way that I wanted to implement the small multiples. Again, coming across a client scenario where they just wanted a whole bunch of basically repeating bar charts. Like, all right, well, it's all the same thing. I really don't want to have to put like six visuals on the page for this. There's got to be some way that I can like break these out. And yeah, I thought of small multiples, tweaked the model a bit and came up with a solution. And the beauty of what you've done is that you can easily use the bookmarks to change the type of visuals at once and be able to see as a matrix or as with... Uh, well, uh, potentially, yeah. There also is the customized visual option that's part of the Power BI service. And that would actually allow you to come up here, say, uh, customize visual, and then you would change. be able to then, you know, tweak it, tweak it, uh, change the things in the well, change the visual type. So that's something they can even do in the service themselves. They don't even need bookmarks. You just have to make sure to have customized visuals turned on, I think, in the report settings. I don't. I honestly don't use it that much. I'm trying to remember where this might be. Uh, report settings. Somewhere in here. Uh, personalized visuals. Yeah. Allow, yeah, yeah. Allow report, yeah, there you go. Allow report readers to personalize visuals to suit their needs. Uh, honestly, most of the time, clients don't need that. Managers, execs, consumers, report users, um, if you built it correctly, it should be set up as needed, and then they can just come in, click a couple slices, and they get their data. Usually, the analysts who want to change stuff typically want to use, like, analyze in Excel, and they just want to dump the data into a pivot table and do their own analysis. So I love the idea of personalized visuals. I don't see that many people needing or using okay. it. Because again, the two scenarios of people who don't want to customize, the report should already be built to their needs. And then people who like to customize usually just want to go either into Q&A or they just want to dump the data out into like an Excel environment and play around with it there. All right. Um, can we do a third one? Sure, let me pull up one more something. Let's see what I want to do for the last one. This one, I'll give you a, you guys can get a sneak peek because this one be, will be coming out next Tuesday. Okay. This is more about a, oop, here we go, best practice that's related to date tables and some considerations on the hierarchy types. I'm actually going to be doing a couple of videos on date tables. Uh, I always look to Adam Saxon and Guy on a queue. We, we talk quite a bit, and he's a he's a good inspiration for um, ideas, things to to, uh, to do, because he he's very good at 
kind of knowing what people need. And and one thing that I haven't done a ton of, or, or tried to avoid, but he started doing more of and rec- even recommended is 101, like basic introduction, just, you know, five things to clean up your fields list. Um, basics on date, you know, it's just really simple, straightforward stuff. And like that, that's where most people are going to want to watch. And uh, I, I, back when I blogged at Power Pivot Pro, there was a philosophy that I kind of was taught is never do an article that somebody else has already done. I'm like, but everybody's already done like date table stuff. And I think my reframe is that like, yes, it has been done before, but I'm, I'm still going to put my own spin on it. There's something that will still be unique. I, yeah. um, and it's not going to be because I'm conscious of, I don't want to just like copy somebody else's material and then say, well, well you just copy that article. I want to be cognizant not to steal, you know, intellectual property from anybody. But I think that I have enough my own opinions at this point that I, I could probably cover any topic and still be unique and provided. Yeah. A, 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 yes, yeah. So I, I'm trying to lean more into those. This was one thing that um, I actually started wanting to do a basic on two ways to make date tables. And then as soon as I started to do it, I realized there's another thing that I do in date tables that I actually really like to implement. Uh, but there's two types of hierarchies uh, that I consider that to implement. There is a dependent hierarchy and an independent. And I'll explain kind of what, what both means. So let me sh- also make sure I share my screen. Um, let's see, share da, 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 da. this one. Okay. So dependent hierarchy would be this. From the top level, you can see that in the actual axis, we have the calendar hierarchy in here. That is year, quarter, month, and date. Now these are these are isolated. It is just the year, just the quarter, just the month, date. So that means that if I was to like just go down to the next level, use the go to next level option, the hierarchy uh, controls. It just shows me Q1, Q2. So this may be beneficial for some, but it, I see kind of an issue where the fact that that means that this is Q1 for multiple years. It's not just quarter one for one yeah. year, lumping everything together. So normally the way you'd want to navigate this is you want to use the it's expand or drill down. Yeah. Yeah. So like dr- drilling down, I am getting just the, the, the quarters for 2014. And if I use the expand option, it concatenates it. It does the year and the quarter. So it expands it out, but it it, it continues to branch out and can and it includes every level from the top down. So that these to me, those are the two safe navigation experiences. Um, there again, there might be somebody who actually does find value to know, hey, across all of our data, historically, what quarters perform better? You know, and th- this might actually show them that, but to me, it's ambiguous data, and you know, I think it can be confusing for people. So typically, if I have an independent hierarchy like this, I will come over to my format painter, to my visual header, and I will turn off show next level. So that means that when it's published to the service, they will have you know drill up, drill down, and they'll have expand, but this middle one will be disabled. It just It's not an option. So it helps to control, to enforce that they don't accidentally do this and start getting confusing data. Right. Now, personally, I, I like independent hierarchies, which is this one over here. So what I've actually done is I've created fields in my calendar table that is year, and then the quarter year level already has both layers. It is quarter, you know, space and year. My month year is month and year. So like that level by itself already contains the entire context to tell you all that. So now I can actually use the go to next level option here. Um, So I can go down to, to, didn't actually want to do that one sec. Uh, back up. There we go. All right. So from the top level, if I go to next level, there is Q1 in 2013. Now that looks similar to the expand on this one. They look very, very similar to each other. However, here's where the, the difference comes into me. If I, if I expand again to go to month year on my dependent hierarchy, because it's concatenating them all together, it can't show show it in a continuous axis. So there's, there's two primary axis types. There's categorical and continuous. Continuous is when you actually have a date data type, um, it will not show you every single label. It will show you something that looks closer to this because it doesn't have to show all of them. It knows yeah, it's continuous. There, people under, yeah, people understand that, that dates are continuous, so it doesn't have to show all of them because you can hover over and get the rest. So it gives you a clean axis and it compresses it to fit in the visual because these are all text fields and it has to concatenate them categorically. So that means it has to show every single one because it doesn't understand these are dates. So you start having to get a scroll bar. And then if I do that again, 
you have to go all the way down to here. So really the only way to, to, to show this well is you have to use the drill down because it just it doesn't really work anymore after you get to the month level. With an independent hierarchy, like quarter and year, it's going to be, uh, it's, it is text. Year is a number. But by the time that I get to month and year, the month year uh, column itself, if I open up my column, I have that set as a date data type. It is essentially converted to like January 1st, February 1st, but it is an actual date data type formatted as a month. So because this level is a date data type, it's able to, to change automatically from categorical to uh, continuous that can display on the axis and then date as well on the bottom. You know, it, it's, it's messy, but it still at least displays the date data type. So I actually really like independent hierarchies and that I provided the clients. And then what I will also do is then just kind of flipping it around, I disable expand because we don't need this anymore. You don't need to show every level from the top down because each level is independent and it, it contains the entire context of the level it's at plus the year. So that's what I usually build out. I normally provide both the clients and I give them two hierarchies in their model so they can choose, but I typically deploy an independent hierarchy uh, interesting oh that's just the calendar query uh that that's in there and then put that into the to the visual so um that's going to be the video that i'm having come out next week with you know corresponding file download but i'm giving people kind of a, a taste of both giving them examples of why you might want to use one or another uh but for me i consider a best practice to create more of an independent hierarchy i think it just gives a better navigation experience and and again at least at the lower levels it cleanly fits more data onto the uh uh, under the visual with without having to get a dreaded scroll bar, which I try to avoid as the best practice in, in native yeah. visualizations. Can you go over the independent, how you created that? Yeah, so these are all basically calculated columns. So uh, I'll also have another video coming out probably in a few weeks that will be on how to create a calendar table. You can do it in DAX. You can do it in, in Power Query. Uh, in, in, uh, in Power Query. Uh -huh. uh, depending on how you want to create it, uh, the best practice that like Marco and Alberto will say is that you want to do it. It always should start at the beginning of the earliest year and end at the end of your latest year. So I basically use my sales table to determine where my range is. And I, I use the date function, which allows me to specify the year, the day, or sorry, the month and the day. I just grab the, the minimum year from that table and then one, one for beginning of the year. And then the max year from my, um, sales table and then just 1231. So that way it creates a full range of both. I do know some people who like to basically just do it to this. Ah, oh, here we go, something like that. And this, what this kind of does is it, it, it cheats a bit to like help with uh, rolling totals and other stuff to make sure you don't accidentally get future dates. You basically make sure that it's always to date. This would be a calendar year to date table rather than a calendar full year table. So it, it's a kind of a little hack that sometimes people do, but I, I personally just prefer to keep both full range in there. Um, and then for, for all the columns, um, you kind of just, you start to build them out one by one, like pretty standard month. That's just, that's the month name. Uh, but for my independent hierarchy, what I did is I month year, uh, I just took my month name and a, a space and my calendar year. And I think I originally started with this column as a, uh, as a display output. So honestly, what it should probably be, and I'll, I'll do this for, for you guys. So that's going to be start, there we go, start a month date. That actually probably should, that's going to be more than likely a better practice that, that I should have in here. There we go. But that's my month and year. It's just simply, you know, the, the start of the month, so January, February, March, April, May 1st, uh, and that can be formatted to be displayed as a month. My quarter year, that is actually text. Like there's, I could, in theory, anchor it to the start of, of the um, the quarter as the whatever the, the first day of that month is. But the one reason I generally don't do that is there's no format string you can apply into here that does like Q1, something like that. Q1, so yeah, I yeah. keep that as text because it's just really the only proper way to display it. And then year, it's just a whole number. Um, but that way, each one has the, you know, the full date context in that level. Uh, and hierarchies... There is a bit of a shift that you have to go through now. You can only create hierarchies now in the model view because wow. people used to accidentally drag and drop and create hierarchies mm -hmm. all the time. One of the most common things I would see in models is 
randomly created hierarchies all over the place <laughs> because they just accidentally drag two columns of each other. So you make them in here. I didn't know that. you can remove them, move them around. Yeah, so they, they're only in the modeling view now. They added that two, three months ago. Um, so it's entirely configured in here. Uh, and then the other thing that I often do too, as you can see on both of these, I put them in a display folder for hierarchies. So my date table is organized with a folder for my hierarchies and a folder for my actual columns themselves. So that's how I'm able to uh, stick them into there. Oh yeah, and I, I, one thing that I didn't mention is here. Uh, that's one other thing that I do is, because uh, quarter year won't actually sort correctly by itself, just due to the, the alphabetical sorting um, and the way that it's displayed. There we go, Q1, Q2, it, like, uh, it wouldn't normally be in this correct order. So what I actually do is I that's do a quarter year enough. num which is simply just year followed by like 2013-1, 2013-2. And that numerically is in the correct sort order. So that's there created simply just to be hidden. And then there's a sort by that sorts by that column. But that's just a, a column that's used for nothing but just simply sorting my text field uh, to be to allow the access to display in the correct order. Wow. Um, so I think at the time you were not showing us the field. So let's look at the fields again. The fields that you have in the independent hierarchy table. Oh, you mean the the the, the okay. sales prior year and year over year. Right. And uh, the independent yeah. hierarchy is all put in the in the shared axis. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's a it's a one stop drag and drop. Is like not, another nice thing about a hierarchy. I because I mean I could do this and this. <laughs> you know, I I could add these one at uh, one at a time, but much easier just to be able to create the hierarchy and, and pop them all in at the same time. So um, they, you just put that into the shared axis, exactly. All right, that's great. Okay, this is pretty much interesting. Any tidbits on formatting, conditional format? Because I know you're a master of that. Explore any places that you see that symbol. Every time you see the F of X, you know, that's a, a just, uh, it creates an opportunity to have a question of, hey, so the legend, the color, all right, that that's the, you know, the, the, the text color there. Is there is, a, is there any benefit to maybe changing that? So anytime you see that, just, you know, give yourself five seconds to think like, hmm, could I maybe change this at any point? Uh, even this, you know, right here, you know, the, the start and stop axis, you can actually dynamically um, change that into here to actually be able to, con uh, to control that across the x-axis where you can have a slider that actually lets you um, control where you want this to start and stop specifically for this visual. So th there's lots of ways to, um, you know, explore that. But th just consider this a symbol that should indicate an opportunity to just ask a question rather than fixed. Is there is there any user interaction or model interaction that I can do to create a KPI or some slicer that can maybe uh, modify or edit this? Because they continue to add these, and you'll you'll see them pop up more and more as they they roll out more and more of those features. Wow, that, that's interesting. All right, it's been a very great time with you. Um, definitely, there's going to be part two <laughs> in series, and um, it's been amazing with you. But like your last words for people learning Power BI, what is the best way to learn Power BI? I mean, you are so great with what you do. I mean, personal um, experiences that you can share on. What's the best way to learn Power BI? Certainly, um, continue to you know, follow the blogs and everything else. I know I try to cover both new features and, and other stuff, but myself and a lot of the other top 10 ones, you know, like Accelerator BI, uh, SQL BI, um, uh, BI Elite, a lot of you know, guy in a cube, great ways to continue to learn small amounts, but I there is a great benefit to just taking a couple of the, the structured courses. Like it's it's one thing to kind of just watch short videos and you learn little random bits here and there, but really just being able to go through an actual structured course is super helpful. Uh, I, I personally have one myself that's on uh, yeah, design cool. and everything from the front end. Yeah, that, that's on SkillWave. Those are great. Actually, a lot of the other stuff that's on SkillWave that, that Matt Allington does for, for, for modeling, and then Ken Pulse and Miguel Escobar, they both do for um, for DAX, uh, or sorry, for Power Query. Um, it really does go a long way. Like I, 
my first thing that I took way back in the day was Rob Colley's, you know, like power pivot um, course. And it really, really helped me get a jump start on, on learning to that. So like, even for people like I know it's, it's a couple hundred dollars sometimes for some of them, or maybe like a hundred, 150, it, it will really shorten the time um, for you to get to a certain level of consistency versus just trying to like read it across all these blogs, but they're all disconnected because there's a story and a journey that goes through structured learning, regardless of what course that you take. So I think that for people getting started, that it, it really will empower you a lot. If you just take a couple of basic courses on, you know, modeling, back end stuff, and then probably a little bit of report design from the front end. That's from the pro. Just because sometimes I agree with him that moving from one video to the other is not the best because they might not be a storyline for you to follow, but a structured course. I took one with um, yep. EDX at the time when yep. Microsoft had the Microsoft certificate um, for professional data yeah, science. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I took that. So it was very helpful because you could go through the two one after the other. There's a storyline to it. Like you're saying, if you want to um, enhance your um, visualization skills, um, skill waves had one, um, read. you could also take that one and be able to learn how to design properly. So it's always good to take a structured course. After that, you have the basics and then you can start watching other videos that we do for exactly. you. It's been so amazing. I mean, this is one of my best so far. Um, having Reed Havens, the interviewer of interviewers, on my show and my channel, I've learned a lot, and I hope you have also. Subscribe to my channel and also check out um, with Havens Consulting, Reed's um, LinkedIn profile, and also on Twitter, so that you can catch up more on what he's going to release week in, week out. It's amazing and we, it's nice having you. Um, hopefully you can send me the links to the various PBIX files and then I'll share it with people also. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, um, I'll just direct you like to, to the, uh, just to the blog files page that's on mine that always has like a chronological list of basically every file that will be available. Probably so, over 100 in there at this point. Thank you so much, Reed, for the time. And subscribe to my YouTube channel for more. Um, this is the end of part two of my interview with Reed. And catch you same time, some other time. Follow my blog and my YouTube channel. Have a nice day. Absolutely. Thank you.